Story seven of the House with the Mezzanine and Other Stories by Anton Chekhov. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story seven My Life The Story of a Provincial Part four. Once after dinner he came running into the wing, panting, to say, Your sister has come to see you. I went out and saw a fly standing by the steps of the house. My sister had brought Anuita Blagovo and a military gentleman in a summer uniform. As I approached, I recognized the military gentleman as Anuita's brother, the doctor. "'We've come to take you for a picnic,' he said, if you've no objection. My sister and Anuita wanted to ask how I was getting on, but they were both silent and only looked at me. They felt that I didn't like my job, and tears came into my sister's eyes, and Anuita Blagovo blushed. We went into the orchard, the doctor first, and he said ecstatically, "'What air! By Jove, what air!' He was just a boy to look at. He talked and walked like an undergraduate, and the look in his grey eyes was as lively, simple, and frank as that of a nice boy. Compared with his tall, handsome sister, he looked weak and slight, and his little beard was thin, and so was his voice, a thin tenor, though quite pleasant. He was away somewhere with his regiment, and had come home on leave, and said that he was going to Petersburg in the autumn to take his M.D. He already had a family, a wife and three children. He had married young, in his second year at the university, and people said he was unhappily married, and was not living with his wife. "'What is the time?' my sister was uneasy. "'We must go back soon, for my father would only let me have until six o'clock.' "'Oh, your father!' sighed the doctor. I made tea, and we drank it sitting on a carpet in front of the terrace and the doctor, kneeling, drank from his saucer, and said he was perfectly happy. Then Cheprakov fetched the key and unlocked the glass door, and we all entered the house. It was dark and mysterious, and smelled of mushrooms, and our footfalls made a hollow sound as though there were a vault under the floor. The doctor stopped by the piano and touched the keys, and it gave out a faint, tremulous, cracked, but still melodious sound. He raised his voice and began to sing a romance, frowning and impatiently stamping his foot when he touched a broken key. My sister forgot about going home, but walked agitatedly up and down the room and said, I am happy, I am very, very happy. There was a note of surprise in her voice, as though it seemed impossible to her that she should be happy. It was the first time in my life that I had seen her so gay. She even looked handsome. Her profile was not good, her nose and mouth somehow protruded and make her look as if she was always blowing, but she had beautiful dark eyes, a pale, very delicate complexion, and a touching expression of kindness and sadness, and when she spoke she seemed very charming and even beautiful. Both she and I took after our mother. We were broad-shouldered, strong and sturdy but her paleness was a sign of sickness. She often coughed, and in her eyes I often noticed the expression common to people who are ill, but who for some reason conceal it. In her present cheerfulness there was something childish and naive, as though all the joy which had been suppressed and dulled during our childhood by a strict upbringing had suddenly awakened in her soul and rushed out into freedom. But when evening came and the fly was brought round, my sister became very quiet and subdued, and sat in the fly as though it were a prison van. Soon they were all gone. The noise of the fly died away. I remembered that Anuita Blagovo had said not a single word to me all day. A wonderful girl, I thought, a wonderful girl. Lent came, and every day we had Lenten dishes. I was greatly depressed by my idleness and the uncertainty of my position, and slothful, hungry, dissatisfied with myself, I wandered over the estate and only waited for an energetic mood to leave the place. Once in the afternoon, when Radish was sitting in our wing, 
Dolikhov entered unexpectedly, very sunburnt and grey with dust. He had been out on the line for three days and had come to Dubechnia on a locomotive and walked over. While he waited for the carriage which he had ordered to come out to meet him, he went over the estate with his bailiff, giving orders in a loud voice, and then for a whole hour he sat in our wing and wrote letters. When telegrams came through for him, he himself tapped out the answers, while we stood there stiff and silent. "'What a mess!' he said, looking angrily through the accounts. "'I shall transfer the office to the station in a fortnight, and I don't know what I shall do with you then.' "'I've done my best, sir,' said Cheprakov. "'Quite so. I can see what your best is. You can only draw your wages.' The engineer looked at me and went on. "'You rely on getting introductions to make a career for yourself with as little trouble as possible. Well, I don't care about introductions. Nobody helped me. Before I had this line I was an engine driver. I worked in Belgium as an ordinary lubricator. And what are you doing here, Pantley?' he asked, turning to Radish. "'Going out drinking?' For some reason or other he called all simple people Pantley while he despised men like Cheprakov and myself, and called us drunkards, beasts, canaille. As a rule he was hard on petty officials, and paid and dismissed them ruthlessly, without any explanation. At last the carriage came for him. When he left he promised to dismiss us all in a fortnight, called the bailiff a fool, stretched himself out comfortably in the carriage, and drove away. "'Andrey Ivanitch,' I said to Radish, "'will you take me on as a labourer? "'What? "'Why?' "'We went together toward the town, "'and when the station and the farm were far behind us, "'I asked, "'Andrey Ivanitch, why did you come to Dubechnia? "'Firstly, because some of my men are working on the line, "'and secondly, to pay interest to Mrs. Cheprakov. "'I borrowed fifty roubles from her last summer, "'and now I pay her one rouble a month.' The decorator stopped and took hold of my coat. Me sail Alerich, my friend, he went on, I take it that if a common man or a gentleman takes interest, he is a wrongdoer. The truth is not in him. Radish, looking thin, pale, and rather terrible, shut his eyes, shook his head, and muttered in a philosophic tone, The grub eats grass, rust eats iron, lies devour the soul. God save us miserable sinners. End of part four.